So first, what is blind source separation? Maybe the first uh, archetypal uh, problem in blind source separation is the cocktail party problem. So it's a audio source separation problem in which uh, you have some guests in a room and the guests uh, all uh, all uh, speak, uh, all discuss together, and uh, uh, and their discussion are recorded by some mic that are put inside of the of the room. And therefore, what the mic are recording uh, is uh, the, the mixed discussion of all the guests that speak uh, together. And the goal of blind source separation is from the sole uh, recording of the mixed signal to try to unmix the signal, that is to find the individual voice of uh, each speaker. So it is an application in audio, but you have also other applications such as in, uh, in spectroscopy in which the goal is to, to find, for instance, the material constituting of, uh, of an object. And today we will focus on uh, hyperspectral and mixing, uh, both, on, uh, uh, both on its application uh, in remote sensing or astrophysics. So now let me, let me uh, detail this, uh, this example to give a bit more mathematical insight of what blind source separation is. So, here we have an hyperspectral image of a supernova remanent. That is a supernova remanent. Ah, oui, merci. Is a, is, a, is a star. Parfait, merci beaucoup. A supernova remanent is a star that has exploded. And it, here, an image, an hyperspectral image is taken of this, uh, of this supernova remanent. And so in this image, you have two spatial dimensions corresponding to the two spatial dimensions of the scene plus a third dimension which corresponds to a spectral dimension because hyperspectral images uh, have a lot of uh, spectral bands. That is, they, they can be seen as a generalization of, uh, of a vertical color image, which have three channels, red, green, blue, and uh, uh, hyperspectral images have much more channels, typically a few hundreds. And therefore, for each pixel of, uh, of, uh, of the image, a wall spectrum is acquired. So in principle, the fact that a wall spectrum is acquired for each pixel means that in principle, you, you should be able to find which material are present in each pixel, because you could compa compare the, the spectrum for a given pixel to a bank of spectra, for instance, and uh, determine using this method uh, which material is present in the pixel. But in practice, things are a bit more complicated because, uh, uh, because each pixel in the hyperspectral image corresponds to a wide area in the sky. It means that uh, uh, each pixel is very likely to be constituted of uh, uh, several elements and not of a single element. For instance, in our supernova example, a pixel can be constituted uh, with, um, with iron, with hydrogen, or this kind of element. And so the spectrum which is observed, observed for a given pixel is not the spectrum of a single element, but rather it is a mixture of the spectra of the different elements constituting, the, constituting the, the pixel. And it is where blind source separation comes uh, uh, at play because uh, it enables to try to unmix, to, to, to separate the, the different uh, spectra in each pixel. More specifically, so usually a, a linear mixture model is assumed is in blind source separation, in which a data set X, that is our hyperspectral image, which is generally reshaped into a matrix, uh, a matrix form, that is each pixel uh, of, the, of the image corresponds to a colon of X. And so this X matrix is assumed to have been generated by the product of two matrices A and S plus some uh, some matrix. And here, A's, A would be, in our example, each column of A would be the spectrum of a single material, let's say, for instance, iron. And each line of S, once we shape in, in the form of, of a matrix, would correspond to the relative concentration of the material in the pixel. That is, if you have like half the iron and half hydrogen, here you will have 50% and here 50%. And so the goal of blind source separation is from the sole knowledge of X to try to estimate the generative A and S factors up to some uh, limited indeterminacies. 
So of course, it's a new, it's a new post problem because you have an infinite number of possible solutions, and therefore, what most uh, methods have, uh, have tried to do over the last decade was to introduce some additional priors on the suit after uh, factors, uh, and specifically about uh, the, the source, the S factor. So the first method, uh, one of the first methods was the ICA uh, uh, method, that is the independent component analysis, which assumes. The, the line of S to the sources to be statistically independent. And uh, since then, there have been other methods such as non negative matrix factorization, which assumes uh, the coefficient of the matrices to be non negative. And today, we will speak about sparse matrix factorization, in which we will assume that S is sparse, potentially in a transform domain such as a, a wavelet uh, domain. And this is a, a very good prior for natural image since most natural images are sparse in, uh, in, the, in the wavelet domain. And so in practice, how do we solve a, a blind source, sparse blind source separation problem? We write it in the form of, uh, of, an, optimiz of an optimization problem, having three terms. The first term is a data fidelity term, in which we want to, to make sure that the A and S we are estimating uh, are well uh, explaining the data set plus a sparsity promoting term. Here we use the L1 norm, and so the sparsity is informed in a transform domain Fs, plus a, a last constraint, which is the oblique constraint, which enables to avoid degenerated solution, because if you only use the first two terms, you have a trivial solution, which is you take S having only zero coefficient and A having coefficient that tends toward infinity. And therefore, you constrain all your uh, all the colon of A to lie on the unit sphere to avoid this uh, degenerative solution. <laughs> and between these, uh, two, uh, these two first terms, the data fidelity and the sparsity term, of course, you have a trade-off between these two terms, which are controlled by some hyperparameter tuning, which is usually done by, uh, by N by the user. And these parameters are here the or S matrix, uh, because so here I choose the most generic way and I, I assume that there is uh, one parameter per pixel that can be tuned. But of course, this is without loss generality. You can assume that all the coefficients in RS are the same, in which case you have a single uh, hyperparameter. And so what are the difficulties of blank source separation? The first difficulty is that it's a non-smooth problem due to the presence in particular of the L1 norm. Therefore, we need to, to use a proximal operator. Um, it's also a non-convex problem, that is, uh, is there is not a single uh, global uh, minima. And also, it requires a difficult parameter, uh, hyperparameter tuning, in particular, uh, in particular, uh, so we need to tune this RS parameter, which is not at all trivial, as we will see. And therefore, overall, it makes that blind source operation method uh, generally require a lot of input from the user. And uh, in the following, we'll ask how we can uh, go toward more uh, automatic methods. So the, the talk will be divided into three parts. The first one will be, we will explain a bit more precisely the, the problem of uh, parameter tuning. And uh, I, will I will then speak about a heuristic on how to find automatically the hyperparameters uh, in the source operation. Then we will speak about uh, uh, quite a funny extension to, uh, to, to background target separation in Sarin and Gips. That is a blind source separation, uh, uh, source separation problem uh, with complex images. And then I will speak a bit more about uh, maybe more recent work uh, that uses a new, new trend in, in, uh, in, um, in uh, deep learning to, uh, to enable to propose uh, new neural network for sparse plane source separation. So the last part will be more devoted to the parameter. So before going into the details of how to tune the hyperparameter, maybe we should start by, um, by speaking a bit about the, the way we have to optimize such a cost function. So as I said, this cost function is non-convex, but however, it is multi-convex. That is, it's non-convex when you consider the, the tuple A and S, but it is convex when you want to optimize it over one of the factors and you fix the other one. And mo most, uh, most method, most optimization method to minimize this cost function use this fact by alternating between an update of A and an update of S. 
One of the first methods to have had some uh, theoretical guarantee of convergence is the block coordinate descent, in which you will do a full update of, uh, of S, that is, you will minimize all the cost function over S, then you will minimize it again over A, and you alternate between, uh, between both. More recently, uh, another algorithm has been proved to converge, which is the PALM algorithm, and the PALM algorithm is slightly different in the sense that it will not perform a wall minimization over S or A at once, but it will only alternate between two uh, proximal gradient steps uh, over S and A. And lastly, there is a, a, another, uh, another algorithm, which is a bit different because contrary to the, these two algorithms, this one has no theoretical guarantee. This algorithm is a projected alternative B square in which, uh, in which uh, what you do is you fully minimize the data fidelity term over one of the factors, for instance, here S, by applying the pseudo inverse of A to X, and then you apply the, then only you apply the, the, the proximal operator, that is the soft resolving of the L1 norm to obtain the rest. So this one is not gradient based, it's more D square based, and the difference with the other one is that it does not have any uh, theoretical guarantee. However, in practice, it has been reported to obtain very good results in blind source separation. And uh, therefore, our goal will be to, to explain why and to try to, to make uh, the uh, uh, time algorithm, which has theoretical guarantee, to, to work as good as this one empirically. Yes. And you might take a question? Yes. So regarding the guarantees? Yes. So it leads, uh, since you have a non complex problem yes. over A and S, uh, what you can expect is to find a local, uh, local solution? Yes, exactly. You, you can expect just to have a critical, a critical point. You... So, okay. But regarding the last one, uh, it's a decent algorithm. This one? Yes. Yes, it's a decent algorithm, but the thing is that since you don't uh, you don't control at all the, the the step size, you can in principle go uh, it's a bit if you were alternating between uh, optimizing in a direction for optimizing over A and optimizing in another direction for optimizing over S, and if you don't, don't uh, if you don't control the the speed to which you decrease this data fidelity term. What can happen is that you could have um, you could have a situation in which you would alternate between uh, you, you would loop basically, ah, okay. and this is why this is why it has no theoretical guarantee. It could be. Feel free to interrupt me for for the question. <laughs> So the first study we, we did about this topic was uh, we tried to explain why uh, projective alternative square tends in practice to have better empirical results than the PAM algorithm. And more specifically, what we looked the, the at was... Yes. Yes. What do you mean by better empirical results? Like yes. In terms of image quality or... Exactly. I, I, I'm just coming to that. It's a very good question. Uh, so, it, it, it gives better uh, results in the sense of uh, unmixing. If you, if you generate a data set, a mixed data set, with two generating factor A and S, you multiply them. Um, the question is uh, how efficient is PALM or another algorithm efficient to uh, estimate the generating, A, the, the generating A and S factors? Can, can, you, can you come back to the generating factor? And so this is here what we assess with the uh, empirical study in which we have generated synthetic mixture and we have uh, looked at the capacity of PALM to, uh, to estimate A and S factors. <coughs> so this is this plot here. And so what we had in the simulation, we have two sources and we assume that there was only a single parameter per source. That is the RS matrix is uh, with this shape. And since we have only two sources, it means that we have only two hyperparameters and that we can perform an exhaustive search on this hyperparameter and to see the behavior of PALM uh, algorithm, its, capa its capacity to unmix the signal uh, uh, as a function of these two parameters. So here it is this kind of plot. So in blue, we have very, very bad separation and in red, very good separation. And actually, if you, if you have a precise look, you see that uh, it's very difficult to, to tune the, the hyperparameters 
because uh, the results are very quickly deteriorating. Here you could see things that uh, the, the diagonal uh, taking lambda two equal to lambda one is the best choice. Is the best choice, but actually it's not the case uh, because the best results are not even in the on the diagonal. It means that you cannot uh, you cannot uh, take L two equal to L one for good results, and it's very difficult to do to tune L two and L one in practice. And so, we, with this kind of experiment and other one, we, we finally uh, shown that uh, PAN suffers from different drawback in range of separation. Uh, actually, it suffers from what we call the low efficiency. That is, uh, it is very difficult for a given X to choose the actor parameters enabling us to have good and mixing uh, the results. It has a low versatility. That is, uh, if you have for, uh, found a good RS. Uh, set for a given data set, uh, this choice does not generalize to other data set, and it has a low reliability that, that is that PALM uh, is, suffer, is highly dependent on the initialization, since the problem is, uh, is non convex And it means that at the end, uh, um, these this issues are very important for, for users because uh, because it's very difficult to tune the hyperparameter and to make PALM uh, have good results in practice. And this is something that is not very, that is not much discussed in the literature, where people usually fix their hyperparameter using some ground truth signal that are not available in practice. So, at the end, we have the, the, the conclusion of that is that we have two, two families of algorithms. The, the block coordinate and palm algorithm are algorithms that are mathematically solved, they have theoretical guarantee. But in practice, they are difficult to use because they don't, do not propose any automatic parameter choice, and the parameter choice is complicated, and they are not robust to spurious uh, critical points. And on the other end, you have this other uh, category of algorithm, the so projecting alternative square, which has been empirically reported to obtain good practical results. And in particular, this algorithm, which is a projecting alternative square based algorithm, which uh, enables uh, an automatic hyperparameter tuning uh, of the of the of the sorry, which enables uh, uh, an automatic hyperparameter tuning. And so the question that we asked ourselves then was: Is it possible to make PAN easy to use in practice, uh, to have theoretical guarantees by um, by uh, by extending the automatic parameter choice of GMCA, this algorithm? to the palm algorithm. And this is what we study. And to answer to that, I will, I will, first, uh, I will first present how, uh, how the, this automatic parameter tuning is done in palm, in, in GMCA, sorry. So in GMCA, the, the RS hyperparameters are also chosen in this form. It means that we have a single hyperparameter per source. And they are iteratively estimating during uh, the GMCA iteration. And they are, they are estimating using this formula, that is, the each parameter for a given source i is estimating using this, where MAD is the, the MAD operator is a robust estimator of the uh, standard deviation. It is robust in the sense that it is uh, insensitive to uh, sparse perturbation. It is the mad of a sparse signal is, uh, is very small. And so why do we use this in, GSA, in GMCA? Actually, it is uh, quite simple to understand. If you look at uh, GMCA iteration, you have that uh, when you update S, you do a projected B square uh, update. So here you apply the pseudo inverse of A to X, and you resolve it uh, using the soft assembly. And actually, the argument for using the MAD is a fixed point based argument, which is that if at some point GMCA uh, find during its iteration the true A star, the true the, the, the A that we are looking for, what we would like is that it, uh, it, uh, it stops and uh, it does not move from A star. And S is updated to be the A star, so the estimator of S becomes the, the true S that we are looking for. And so if we have a look at the iteration, if we assume that A has been correctly estimated in GMCA iteration, if we replace X by its expression, we obtain this new formula, this new formula for S update. 
And so here at this point, we would like we would like that s here the estimate is equal to the s star, the true generative factor. And therefore, the goal is uh, the, the, what what, uh, what we would like is that the soft resolving here uh, would uh, denoise the signal by the s star signal by removing this noise term. And actually, this is quite easy to do because here s star is a sparse signal by assumption our source are sparse, and this term is a Gaussian noise. So here we have a problem of uh, uh, the denoising of uh, a sparse signal, and this is quite easy to this is quite easy to perform because what we can do is we know that if uh, so this is a uh, so this is a centered Gaussian noise if we threshold. Uh, all the values between minus three times the standard deviation of this Gaussian noise and plus three times the standard deviation of this Gaussian noise, we remove 99% of this Gaussian noise. And actually, this is, quite, this is exactly what we will do. We will find the RF parameter based on the standard deviation of the Gaussian noise. And uh, it will give us so for each for each source the, the good uh, the good uh, hyperparameter. So uh, the, the difficulty at this point is that we don't know directly the standard deviation of this term because what we have access to is only so this whole term. And this is where the MAD estimator comes at n because the MAD, as we say, is a robust estimator of the standard deviation, and it is robust to a standard deviation. That is the MAD of the MAD of this term will be roughly equal to the standard deviation of the Gaussian noise. And so it makes us an automatic, an automatic way of tuning the, the hyperparameter in, uh, in GMCA based on a fixed point argument uh, saying that uh, if we converge towards a good solution, the role of the, the source resolving is just to, to remove the, the noise, the back projecting noise. And so if we try to extend that to, to PALM, the good news is that if we do the same analysis with PALM uh, iteration, if we have found the, the good A and S factors in PALM, the good news is that we also have the same kind of uh, interpretation in terms of uh, Gaussian noise removal. So it is exactly the same as in GMC. However, if we only assume that we have uh, found during the iteration of PALM the true A but not the true S, that is, if we are, if the estimated source is equal to the true sources plus uh, uh, an error term, this uh, this uh, this interpretation does not hold anymore because all the errors that we do on the estimation of the sources are transferred to the other sources due to uh, a remixing that is due to the the way palm updates are done. And therefore, we cannot use directly the the, directly the same the same method. Uh, as in GMCA within the PAN uh, algorithm. And to try to, to try to still make it work, what we did was we tried to limit as much as possible this uh, interference term, which breaks our, uh, our interpretation in terms of Gaussian noise removal. And to do that, what we did was we, we, we decided to start from a good initialization, making that when PAN starts, this error term is very small. And in addition, we decided to use reweighted L1, a reweighted L1 norm, enabling to uh, remove part of the of the errors that we have here, which are due to the bias of the L1 norm. And so, if you do that, these terms here of interferences becomes negligible, and the MAD is only calculated on the noise term, which is what we what we want. So, at the end, uh, we have uh, what we propose is to have a two-step strategy in which we first uh, apply a GMCA algorithm, giving us a first guess of the solution. And from this first guess, we compute the reweighting weight uh, that we will use in the PAL, and we compute the threshold based on the MAD heuristic. And using that, it makes that we obtain good, uh, good parameter for the, for the PALM algorithm. And so if we, if we come back to our uh, introductive example, and if we try different algorithms, we see that we obtain a, a better separation accuracy with a two-step algorithm than both with PAL and GACM and GMCA separately. It means that we can do better than both algorithms by combining them in a, in a double. 
And at the end, the two-step algorithm that we have has both, uh, the, the, is both easy to use because we have an automatic hyperparameter choice. There is nothing to do for the user. And it has also a theoretical guarantee because PAM has theoretical guarantee. And so this is just uh, just quickly another application that we really uh, that we really uh, that is really recent since the, the article was ac accepted in a conference like uh, four days ago. Uh, and so this is an application in biomedical imaging in which here the goal is to separate uh, different tumors that may be present in the body. And so here we really used the same kind of algorithm except that uh, we added also non-negativity constraint, uh, enabling to, to make the, the program still better post. And we also had a quite good result to separate the, the different tumor in the, in the book. Any questions so far? Not really a question, but uh, it's, it's like a simulated and alien approach. Yes, exactly, exactly. It's really, GMCA is based on, uh, on annealing. Exactly, and uh, and the two-step algorithm is really a bit like this. Exactly. So now, what we will see is an extension of uh, this work to, uh, to to SAR images. So SAR images are uh, uh, remote sensing uh, imaging modality, uh, and it is so SAR uh, SAR imaging systems are active sensor because they send uh, a waveform, and they measure the backscatter waveform. And actually, what they measure is the amplitude of the backscatter wave, waveform and the phase between the, the sent waveform and the backscatter waveform. So at the end, they yield both an amplitude and a phase, and uh, they enable us to have a complex image. So it is a difference with what we, we just saw. Here, the images are complex. And if you look at these complex images, so here I display the modulus of the, of the image, so this is the same image. What you could see is that um, this can be decomposed into two, uh, two subcomponents. The first uh, component, which is the background, and this background corresponds to part in the image in which the, the waveform has been uh, backscattered by diffuse backscatterer. So for instance, vegetation. vegetation. And you have a, a second part, which uh, corresponds to the target. Uh, and the targets are, in contrast, a very uh, strong backscatterer, such as uh, the corner of some building, this kind of stuff. And what we want to do here is we want to separate the background from the, from the target. So it, it can be recast as a source separation problem, a complex source separation problem, in which we have a single observation since we have a single uh, sandwich. And so what we want to do is, from the sole knowledge of X, to retrieve both the background and the target. So this is a severely ill post problem, and we have only a single information, so we really need to introduce more priors about, uh, about what we are looking for. And therefore, what we assume is that uh, we will assume more, more, uh, more structure uh, on, the, on the target. Uh, specifically, we assume that the targets are Dirac, Dirac in the scene, and uh, these Dirac's are convoluted by the, the SAR imaging system uh, point spread function, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, we know that it is a cardinal site. And so at the end, it makes that uh, all the, all the, that the, the, different, uh, the different targets in, the, in the, the image, if you zoom, really resemble cardinal site. And the thing which is important to understand is that um, these targets have continuous position in the scene. It means that they can be everywhere. But once they are imaged, this, uh, this continue, this, uh, these targets are, um, are sampled, actually. And uh, these cardinal signs appear when the target do not lie on the image sampling grid, but rather when it is uh, between several points. And what we want to do is then we want to estimate for each target the amplitude, the complex amplitude, and also the localization of the maximum of the, of the target with a subpixelic accuracy. To do that, we still assume, we still need a few more assumptions. So we will assume that the real and imaginary part of the background are Gaussian, uh, are Gaussian noise uh, with unknown variance. 
and we will furthermore assume that there are only a few uh, targets within the image. That is, uh, the targets are sparse. And also in the following, but this is not for, uh, this is just for the sake of uh, simplicity. Uh, we will uh, assume that we don't have uh, a SAR image, but we have SAR vector. We will work in 1D. The extension to 2D image is really uh, trivial. It's uh, just to make things clear. So under this hypothesis, you can write uh, the you can write the, 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 the target recovery problem as an optimization problem by uh, introducing a dictionary phi in which you will have all the possible uh, cardinal signs at all the possible uh, position of the sampling grid. Um, and uh, then you can write uh, the problem as an optimization of the cost function where you are looking for the, uh, for the complex uh, amplitude of the cardinal signs. And you, you promote the sparsity using, uh, for instance, an L1, an L1 norm. And lambda is some uh, hyperparameter. And so if we now want some pixel precision on the target position, what we can do is we can perform some oversampling and we can, uh, we can oversample this dictionary uh, by rho factor to have a, a one over rho precision in the, in the target localization. Yes, sir. Oui? Well, my question. Uh, ouais. So you said your data are complex value? Yes, exactly. So uh, at some point, I think you need to switch from complex to real value? Uh, I, when, I, when you write the optimization for that? Uh, so what happened is that uh, so, so, uh, this this can be this can be minimized uh, with both imaginary and real part, and this L1 norm is actually an L1 norm on the modulus of the of the of the target. So we really work on the on the complex uh, values, but the L1 norm is on the on the modulus. But in the optimization problem, it's uh, a in the complex. It's what? Sorry, a. Where? Well, Ouais, alpha. It should be yes, it is complex. It, ah, ah, sorry, sorry. Okay, okay. I did not see. Uh, I made a typo. Oh, yes. True. It's it's complex. Sorry, my my mistake. <laughs> and so also the, the good thing is that you can uh, so this phi matrix, of course, is might be expensive to compute because it is uh, it is uh, it is a, a quite big matrix matrix. But actually, uh, you can see that it is a circulant matrix, so you can write everything with convolution, and so in the, in the Fourier domain, uh, you can do the math very, very efficiently. I just want to mention that. And so if you look at this naive approach, so here you have a signal, so uh, a 1D uh, star image, let's say, with the noise, and here you have five targets, which amplitude are denoted by the red crosses. So if you look at the estimated uh, alpha, you will have these different targets in red, which are not the ones that we are looking for. And in particular, the, there are much more targets in the estimated signal than in the true signal. And this is actually due to the fact that the, the phi dictionary might be very ill-conditioned if, uh, if um, in particular, if the oversampling factor is uh, quite large. So this is uh, this is uh, partly due to that, and the other issue is that uh, it's difficult to set again the, the hyperparameters. Uh, in this case, you have uh, rho equal one. In this case, yes, it was rho equal one. Yes. Um, and so, what we propose to use here to to try to bypass the, the first issue, so that the phi might be too a condition. We propose to use the continuous basis for suite like approach in which all the all the cardinal signs uh, we, we do a, we do a, a Taylor one expansion of all the cardinal signs so here if you have a cardinal sign which is located with a displacement of l i to the to the to the regular grid you can do um, you can do a Taylor expansion and then you will have to turn the cardinal signs over the sampling grid and the derivative of the cardinal signs. And so the shift compared to the, to the sampling grid will be determined by this delta function, which is related to the, to the shift. So we'll do a Taylor one expansion. And then we have a new cost function to minimize, which is this one, where phi are all the cardinal signs at all the possible uh, sampling uh, grid position. 
And here, phi is uh, the, the derivative of the cardinal sign. And now we have uh, to optimize over both alpha and delta. This is non-convex, but now we, we know how to deal with that because it is multi-convex. And so what we can do is we can use again the palm algorithm to minimize it. And this is what we did, which was in contrast to the original work about continuous basis for suite, because in the original work, uh, they used the um, real signal, which were also non-negative, in which case you can rewrite the problem as a convex problem, while here we are in a non-convex setting. So we can write the uh, palm algorithm for the for the continuous basis for suite. And uh, and, uh, and uh, so the, the, the first issue is solved. The second issue, which was how to tune the hyperparameter, is exactly the same as what we did uh, with, the, with, the mad, uh, with the mad operator in the previous part. We can use the same rationale uh, of using the mad operator to, to set the hyperparameter about an argument about the fixed point uh, condition. And this is what we, what we did. And at the end, it gives us an, an automatic algorithm uh, which give, in practice, much better results than uh, just basis for suite or even continuous basis for suite, but uh, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, let's say, uh, uh, hyperparameters that would be chosen uh, only using the, the noise level. And so we, we get, so if you look at this image compared to the ones that I showed before, you, the, it's not perfect. The targets are still splitted, but in general, here they are splitted at most uh, with, the, with the two neighboring pixels and not much. So it's much better than what we had, uh, what we had before. And so maybe further work about, uh, about this problem. What we now need to do is to continue the work about uh, real data sets. So the extension to image is, is not, uh, not difficult at all. It's really uh, easy to write, but the difficulty is that uh, the, the true statistics of the signals might be a bit different to what we assume. And also, uh, we are also uh, looking for a new way of setting the hyperparameter. So MAD operator uh, that we use is a decent heuristic, but it does not work, it's not perfect. And therefore, in the, follow in the, in the future, we are considering to use plug and play method or even unrolling, which is what I will uh, detail next. Any question about this stuff? Okay. So maybe let me finish with, uh, with this part. Um, so, so far, uh, what we have shown was that it was difficult to set automatically the, the hyperparameter in line source separation. And the question we ask ourselves here was, let's say that we have access to some mixture with the corresponding run tools A and S factors. Can we enhance PALM? Can we ma make PALM better work by introducing some long composants within PALM? And the method we used here was algorithm unrolling, which enables to give uh, interpretable neural network by creating them by mimicking the structure of an iterative algorithm. And uh, uh, doing so will enable to bypass the difficulty per parameter choice of PALM and to give uh, more computationally computation, computation, uh, efficient algorithms than PALM. So just to make the, the setting clear, so we have a data set X that we want to, to decompose into A and S, uh, as it was uh, up until now. But in addition, we assume that we have some training set in which we have some different mixture X, with each having a mixing matrix and a source matrix. And we have access to both X and the ground truth, let's say from simulation, from simulation. And so, to perform algorithm unloading, so the idea is, uh, is the following. If you, if you look very synthetically at uh, what PALM is doing, it is updating, let's say, S using a proximal gradient step, and then A. And so, if you rewrite it in the form of a, of a, a, a block, block like this, you have X in input and you have S in output, and the iterative algorithm makes a loop uh, during which you apply uh, at each iteration a nonlinear function uh, having some hyperparameter theta, such as the step size, the sparsity parameter, and you apply it until convergence toward S. What algorithm unruling does is that 
it unwall, it unfolds the iteration, and it proposed to make only a fixed number of iteration to estimate from X S uh, in, uh, without any. And so the good news is that if you have both X and S, you can train this uh, this uh, this kind of neural network architecture because it's now a kind of neural network. You can train it. You can train the hyperparameters uh, end to end from X and S, and it will create like optimized hyperparameters for the, the program at the end. And an interesting thing is that if you do that, you will have optimized parameters, which will make that your algorithm will, in general, require much less uh, iteration using this kind of methods than using uh, classical iterative algorithm. And actually, what uh, Gregor and Lequin, who, who were the first to, to, to propose algorithm unrolling, did was even slightly better, because beyond learning the hyperparameters, they propose to learn a reparameterization of the of the gradient step. Specifically, if you start from the proximal gradient step here, you write you can see that uh, it is uh, equivalent to this update in which you factorize over S and X. And if you write W1 this matrix and W2 this matrix, uh, you have an, a new parameterization. And what uh, Lequin and Gregor did was to say that uh, it, it's better to learn the hyperparameter, but also the reparameterization W1 and W2. And they obtain good results. But actually, if you do that in line for separation, it does not work. Why? Because actually, Gregor and Lequin did that for a comprehensive sensing problem in which they assume that they have a single A mixing matrix, a single, a single A operator. That is, uh, over all the training and test set, A was exactly the same. In blind source separation, since we are in a blind setting, the A varies much across the different data sets, as we can see here in the plot. And so it makes that it does not work uh, anymore in practice. And this is quite easy to understand, because if you look at the original idea of Lequin and Gregor, it was to, to use this parameterization. And so in principle, therefore, W1 and W2 should depend about uh, uh, of A. And so even when they are learned, in principle, they should also uh, depend on A. And the thing is that if you look at this update, W1 and W2 are fixed for all the, uh, all the training sets and test sets. You have a single W1 matrix for all the data sets. And so it makes that if you fix these matrices while A is changing over the different uh, data sets, it, it cannot work. And therefore, what we did was we, we did not use this reparameterization to perform unrolling for blast source separation, but rather this one. In this one, we learn the hyperparameters and only a W matrix, matrix here, but here you still have a part in which the A appears explicitly. And the fact that the A appears explicitly makes that actually uh, you can deal with a varying A over the different, uh, over the different data sets. So this is a good news, and the good news on the other end is that you need to have an estimation of A, which we do not have in blade separation since we are in blade setting. And therefore, what we did was we we think uh, what we did was to uh, incorporate this kind of update within an alternating framework in which we update A and S. And so it makes that we have like a, a learn palm algorithm, a L palm algorithm in which we will learn both the, the hyperparameter and the W for the S update, and we will also, uh, we will, and we will then alternate between uh, the update of S and the update of A. And for A, we, we just learn the, the step size because the problem is actually a bit easier because A is a smaller step. And so this, uh, these parameters are learned from this supervised code function. And if we apply that to uh, our supernova example, actually, with the training on, uh, on simulation, we obtained quite good results because uh, what, we, what we discovered was that LPAL here was able to have a better result than PALM, even if we perform an exhaustive search on a PALM hyperparameter. That is, LPAL do, does largely better than the best possible PALM in, uh, in our city. And also, LPALM was much more computationally efficient uh, with several uh, order of magnitude of, of uh, number of iteration gate. 
And if we compare the LPALM algorithm to other unwall algorithm, such as for instance the Vista, we see that the LPALM works better due to actually this, both this alternating structure and the fact that A appears explicitly inside of the, of the, of the LPALM update. So to conclude, we have started by showing the difficulty of uh, choosing hyperparameter in sparse brain source separation. We have shown that using the MAD operator was a good heuristic to, to set this parameter, but that it was not necessarily uh, the best way. We have extended this to SAR imaging, and to try to do better, we have used algorithm and learning to, to, to learn these hyperparameters. And in the following, what we would like to do is to uh, we like to, to continue to try to do some unrolling for blind source separation for other kind of BSS algorithm, for instance. And we would like also to extend LPAN to, uh, to a bit more challenging setting, for instance, by using a semi or unsupervised cross function, because here a limitation of our approach is that it is supervised. And also by applying it on remote sensing data in which you have spectral variability for each pixel. That is, the spectra that you have is different potentially for each pixel. So this is more complicated uh, than what we do. And also, we will also continue to work on uh, a new method for SAR type data extraction by using, for instance, uh, unrolling or plug and play algorithm. So thank you for, uh, for your attention.